Welcome everyone back to 262A, uh, Learning and Reasoning with Bayesian Networks. Uh, this is our lecture 16, and today we will continue our discussion uh, about causality. In particular, we will be talking about counterfactuals and uh, counterfactual reasoning. Let me get started uh, by showing this uh, picture again that we started with last time, showing the uh, causal hierarchy, or what people also refer to as the uh, causal ladder. The key thing here is that we have uh, three types of reasoning, associational, interventional, and counterfactual. And each one of them is uh, triggered by something. And associational reasoning is triggered by observing something. Interventional reasoning is triggered by actions or interventions or doing. And counterfactual reasoning is about imagining particularly alternate uh, scenarios that are normally conflicting. Now, the key thing about ladder of causation is as you move up the ladder, reasoning becomes more sophisticated. But as uh, we've talked and we'll continue to talk today is that uh, also more information is needed as you move up. So last time we talked about intervention. Today we'll talk about counterfactuals. And I'm going to start by some motivation of the kind of questions or the kind of queries that we will be addressing or that fall under the label of counterfactual reasoning. So this is the first question. And here we're looking at what is the probability that exposure to radiation was a necessary cause of death due to leukemia. This is a very prototypical question. It has a name, actually, as we'll see later. But uh, if you look carefully into this question, you see that it has two parts. Someone was exposed to radiation and died. And then now we're asking, would they be alive if they were not exposed? Now, you see two things here, two scenarios, like the real world scenario in which someone was exposed and died. And now we're asking a question about a hypothetical situation or scenario. What if they were not exposed? This is a mark of counterfactual reasoning where we have two alternating situations. And as you'll see, a mark of counterfactual reasoning is how do I take the information that I learned from the real world that someone was exposed to radiation and died and use it? when I'm actually contemplating the alternate scenario. Here's another question. What's the probability that a random person in the population would both die of leukemia if exposed and survive if not exposed? Again, this is an example of another prototypical counterfactual query. It has its own name. We'll, we'll see that later. And yet another question. What is the probability that any unexposed surviving person would have died of leukemia had they been exposed? They may look similar, but later you would see that they're very distinct questions, and those were selected carefully so that they fall uh, as examples of prototypical queries that have been subjected to a lot of study, as you will see later. But just before we move on, there are a few marks of counterfactual reasoning. One of them is, as already alluded to, uh, that uh, this type of reasoning involves contemplating alternate and conflicting scenarios. So the first question makes that very clear. The second important dimension is it requires an ability to transfer information from one scenario, typically the real world scenario that was realized, to a hypothetical one. And not just in the trivial way of carrying the observations. In fact, you can't carry the observations because they conflict with what you were going to be doing later. But another very important uh, dimension to counterfactual reasoning. And the one that we're going to spend quite a bit of time on, and in my opinion, it's something that doesn't usually get enough treatment when people discuss this subject, is that you do require more refined information when doing counterfactual reasoning beyond what is needed for associational and beyond what's needed for interventional. Usually this is mentioned in passing. No, we're going to actually give this part of the discussion quite a bit of attention because, as you see, it will really reveal the essence of what's going on in counterfactual reasoning in the sense that it will give you some of the key insights uh, behind this type of reasoning. All right. Now, as far as how we're going to proceed in today's lecture, we're going to follow a similar theme like we did last time for intervention. We're going to actually talk about why we need to do this, what additional information we need so that we can do it beyond what was needed in intervention. And these would be a bit interwoven. And then, just like we did last time, we're going to do counterfactual reasoning in two different settings. One is what we call the idealized set. 
And this is when we have a complete model, the model with the additional information beyond what that was needed in intervention. Now, if you remember in intervention, we said, well, let's start with association. We need a distribution, which is just a Bayesian network that specifies the distribution. When we went to intervention, we said, yes, a Bayesian network, but the graph has to be causal. It's not enough for it to have the right independence information. It has to be causal, otherwise we would not be able to do intervention. And now we're gonna add one more requirement and say we need the, the relationship between nodes and their parents to be functional. We're gonna explain what that is. And then we get something called the functional Bayesian network. So Bayesian network, causal Bayesian network, functional Bayesian network. So we're gonna do a lot in this uh, idealized setting because that's pretty important because we'll be operating without constraints so that we can break into what's going on and give the subject its new treatment. And then we'll move into the practical setting. Practical setting, similar to what happened with intervention. I have a graph that is both causal and functional. We'll explain what that means and data. And then we try to actually estimate counterfactual queries uh, based on that. Now, Last time I said another subject that I may get into is how to do uh, causality using tractable circuits. I actually gonna do something else uh, instead. In the second part, we will give a general treatment of the syntax and semantics of interventional and counterfactual queries. That's actually a little bit more general than what you tend to see when people discuss these subjects and it will allow us to have a more open-ended type of counterfactual queries beyond the prototypical ones that are typically discussed. A reminder of textbooks before we move on, association, our textbook in blue, the classical textbook you does uh, from 20 years earlier, if you want textbooks on intervention and counterfactuals, the causality is the technical main reference. This is high level. And as I mentioned last time, this is another technical but lighter version of the causality book that's available online. Okay, let's get started. The first thing I want to say is when you hear discussions about causality. There is a focus on uh, the hierarchy that is related to the kind of reasoning, associational reasoning, interventional reasoning, and then counterfactual reasoning. But there is a parallel to that, an information hierarchy in the sense of information that's needed for each one of them. So as mentioned earlier, association reason requires a Bayesian network, a distribution. Any graphical structure will work as long as the independence assumptions that it portrays are okay. And then as we've seen last time, we need a causal Bayesian network to do interventional reasoning. Uh, we insisted on the graph not only having the right independence, but it has to be uh, causal. Now we're gonna talk about what we need for counterfactual reasoning, which is the notion of a functional Bayesian network. And it's very similar to a causal Bayesian network with an additional requirement, very important requirement. And just before we move on, if you look at the literature uh, on this subject, people who talk about functional Bayesian networks, probably you don't hear it as much. You probably hear the notion of structural causal model today. And the structure of causal model, which we will discuss uh, later, is uh, in general, it, it's more general. But given how it's practiced today, it's pretty much the same as a functional Bayesian network. So it's really a matter of terminology. Earlier, you hear more functional Bayesian network, now you hear more structural causal model. We'll, we'll discuss both of them, but we'll start with uh, functional Bayesian networks because it's a smoother transition compared to what we've been doing earlier. And one more thing before we move on notation. Basically, counterfactual reasoning usually involves two binary variables, and typically they're called X and Y. And in, in this discussion, the two values will be notated X and X bar, Y and Y bar. In the traditional literature, you people use X prime and Y prime. We're doing it this way to be consistent with what we've done already in the course. And these states could be true, false, one, zero, yes, no, on, off, and so on. So because we're going to use this so extensively later, I wanted to have an explicit mention of this notation. And remember our general notation, this represents a set of variables and this represents an instantiation of uh, those variables. Okay, let's get started by talking about functional Bayesian networks, which we would need to do counterfactual reasoning. And the difference between them and causal Bayesian network is this notion of a 
action independence. So we're going to take our time here because, as you'll see once more, this is not about what additional information you need, but it will help us break into really what's happening in, in counterfactual uh, reason. So we'll start with this simple example. You have customers and you're interested in getting them to renew their subscription, and uh, you have the ability to go and offer them an incentive to do that. So offering an incentive causes people to renew. Now, traditionally, if you want to do this, you, you do what you did here. X goes to Y, and then you specify a distribution for Y. Uh, the distribution will say, what is the property that they will renew given that they were offered? What's the probability that they will renew given that they were not offered? And as you see, that kind of information is not sufficient for counterfactual reasoning. So let me tell you what we're going to do to be able to do counterfactual reasoning. And remember, everything here is idealized setting. When we go to the practical setting, it's a different story. What we're going to do is we're going to add this additional node here, U. And U would represent the different causal mechanisms that can govern the relationship between Y and X. What does that mean? Uh, here they are. In this case, you will have four different values. And let me explain them. This is fundamental notation or concepts in counterfactual reasoning. The first says what I have is a responder. What does that mean? Uh, a person that if you offer them, they renew. If you don't offer them, they do not renew. That's this case. The other case is what we call always taker. Someone who would always renew. Doesn't matter whether you offer them an incentive or not. The third one is a contrary. If you offer them, they don't renew. If you don't offer them, they renew. Okay. Sounds weird, but a possibility. And the last one is an always denier, someone who would never renew. It doesn't matter whether you offer them or not. These are the only possibilities that can actually relate these two variables. Think of this as the output of a Boolean function. This is the input. There are four possible Boolean functions with one input, and, and these are exactly these guys. Now, what happens is if we do that and we come to specify the CPT for this variable, that is the conditional probability of y given x and u, we're going to find that this is going to be completely deterministic. There's no uncertainty anymore. Why? Look at here. Uh, I'm breaking this CPT by four groups, depending on whether I have a, a responder, always taker, contrarian, or always denier. Let's look at the first one. What you'll see is for any value of u and x, the value of y is determined. In this case, it's simply following the value of x. Right? Always taker, it will always be true, regardless of what the value of x is. In this case, it will always be opposite to what x is, and so on. In this case, it will always be false. So zero, one, no more uncertainty. The only uncertainty now is on this, on what kind of a creature I have here. Is it a responder, an always taker, a contrarian, or an always denier? Now, terminology. We call this a functional CPT, functional conditional probability table. We say, Y functionally depends on X and U. We will also say that the CPT specifies the functional dependency. I'm just giving you the various variations in which you can get this. We would say that the CPT specifies a functional relationship. The one thing you need to know is when you have the situation, you do typically do not specify a CPT, but you use equations to show the value of Y given X and U, because you're really giving me the value of Y given X and U, you're not giving a distribution in essence. And when we go to structural causal models, that's what's gonna happen. So in this case, for example, you would have an equation that describes the value of Y in, in terms of these two guys. This is saying Y would be true if we have a responder and X happens to be true, or if we have a contrarian and X happens to be false, or we have an always taker, right? You, you can write a similar equation for when Y is false, you don't need this is enough, very good. Now, the next slide is super important because it really both reveals why we need this additional information. What do we lose when we don't have this information? And it will introduce ingredients that will help you understand some of the results that we're going to be talking about later. The title is Why Do We Need Functional Dependencies? Right? So if we use this, here's the functional CPT for Y, here's the CPT for that. Let's do the following. Let's see what happens if you don't do that. One way to see what would happen if you don't do that is let's take this Bayesian network and sum out marginalized variable u. You can do this systematically, right? You sum out this guy and then you get a Bayesian network over x, y. And you're going to get this, which is what you would normally specify. Now, if you look at what is the CPT for y now, it's going to look like this, right? These are simply what you have here. So 
what is the probability that someone would renew given that they were offered this number end up being the probability that they are a responder plus the probability that they are an always taker. If you look what happened here, uh, what is the probability that they were renew given that they were not offered? It will be the probability that they're a contrarian plus the probability that they are always taker. Now we lost critical information. By the way, if you want to know how to do this systematically, the summing out in our book, this section explains this in detail. Now we lost critical information. And that critical information is important for counterfactual reasoning. What did we lose? Let me just explain it. Let's, let's look at some concrete numbers. Let's say that these numbers were like this. 50% uh, of the populations are responders, 30% always takers, 5% contrarians, 15% always deniers. Now, when you do the summing out, that's what you're going to see here. All right? These are the numbers you're going to get. Now, first, mathematically. This distribution has four numbers, but they have to add up to one. So really you have three independent parameters. In this case, these guys have to add up to one. These guys have to add up to one also. So you have two independent parameters here. So you already know mathematically this is less information than that. But let's look at it in a different way. What if these numbers were not this, but you had this situation? So you had 60% responders, 20% all those takers, 15% contrarians, and 5% all those deniers. Now, when you do the summing out, you will also get this. So whether you have this distribution or whether you have this distribution, you're always going to get this. So if you do it the normal way and come and tell me, okay, I make an offer and I want to see what happens to renewal, it's a causal relationship, and I'm giving you this. You haven't told me enough because if you give me this, it could be this or it could be that or many other possibilities that will always lead to that. And I need this kind of information to do counterfactual reasoning as you'll see later. So I hope this makes it clear what we're missing if we actually just do this and not do that or the other way to look at it. What is the additional information that we'll be getting if you do it in this particular way? Now, what we're going to do later is we're going to do a bunch of counterfactual scenarios, complete examples, and we're going to use this versus that. And you see that whether you have this or that, as far as associational and uh, interventional reasoning, you're going to get the same results. But when you go to counterfactual reasoning, you're going to start getting different uh, results. What I wanted to say here is, if you give me any Bayesian network, I can always transform it into a functional one. Here we did the opposite. You gave me a functional one and I gave you the corresponding Bayesian network that's not functional. Now we really want to do the opposite. You can always do that. You can always take any Bayesian network and make it functional. You have, more generally, a variable y and it has these parents. You can always go add this auxiliary guy. Now, conceptually, what this guy, which usually people call a background variable, what it represents is all possible functions from these variables to this, right? Because once you fix what kind of function exists between them and you give me the inputs, you give me the kind of function we're talking about, then this becomes determined. In general, if you have n inputs and we're talking about binary variables here, uh, the number of functions is actually quite a lot. It's this number. All right, but you can always do this. I can always take a Bayesian network and make it functional uh, by adding this guy. We know what this, the meaning of this is, so it can be done systematically. But the parameters that you're gonna put here are not gonna be unique in the sense that you can have many different possibilities for the parameters, but they will always give you back this guy if you somehow the, the, the new variables. And as we already alluded, even though these parameters are different, you will always get the same result, whether you do associational or interventional, but not if you do uh, counterfactualism. The other thing we need to be aware of is many of these functions, people would judge in a real scenario as impossible. So really, in practice, you may not have these many values. Uh, you can omit a lot of them that basically are viewed as impossible. In fact, when people build structural causal models, you'll see later, that's definitely nothing close to this number. They usually have few values for these guys because implicitly deeming that all other functional relations are actually impossible. Okay, guys, so now we can talk about what is a functional Bayesian network because it's straightforward. Just a Bayesian network, but we only have distribution on root nodes, and these are called background variables. And then for nodes that are not root, they are functionally determined or functionally dependent on their parents. That's basically it. Now, in practice, in practice, what happens is that the background variables are assumed to be hidden. I cannot 
observer. And we also would not require knowing how many values they have, okay? That looks pretty good. Further, we do assume that nodes are functionally determined or depend on their parents, but we do not require knowledge of the specific functions. So I'm just giving you a structure and I'm telling you that the internal nodes are functions of their parents, but I don't wanna know that. And, and then you give me data and then the question becomes, are counterfactual queries identifiable from this kind of information and, and the data and under what conditions? And that's what we're going to talk about. That's when we move to the practical setting. So that's pretty good, actually. I just want to emphasize this now because we're going to keep going with the idealized setting for now. And I, I don't want you to be turned off because you may think it's too big, requires too much information. We're doing this because we want to understand what's going on. All right. So uh, let's keep going. What's going to happen next is I will show you a bunch of concrete examples of counterfactual reasoning, and we'll do this on the networks. And it will be a chance for us to introduce various concepts completely before we treat them more formally using equations. You're going to get real insights of what's happening. But before I do this, I just want to do one thing, which is there is a situation, and we've seen that in the Ducatulus, where you can exchange observations and actions, meaning whether you say do X versus observe X, you're gonna get the same results. Uh, we've seen an axiom for this in the calculus that shows when you can do that or when the two will give you the same result. I'm gonna show it to you, it's gonna be hairy, and then I'm gonna look at a very special case of it that we will need. Why do we need this for two reasons? One is a number of the examples I'm gonna show you, they will be such that when you intervene versus observe, you're gonna get the same results. It happens because the examples are small and that's convenient, but the other real reason is later when we talk about identifiability criteria, when are we able to identify counterfactual queries from data, we're going to see that that condition pops up as one of the requirements, some of the results. So uh, here's the axiom from the Duke calculus. I'm not going to read it in details, except to say that it shows that here we have do Z and here we have Z observation action. And I can have this or that, and I'm going to get the same result if something holds. The special case I'm going to look at this is when X is empty and, and W is empty. So I'm going to get rid of these guys. So I'm going to get a specialized version of this that looks like this, which tells me the property of Y given do Z is the same as the property of Y given observe Z. And then this condition simplifies to that. I'm going to even simplify it further by saying that a special case of this is the following that uh, the probability of y given do z is the same as probability of y given z if the variables z are wrong. Now this I want you to remember. So for root variables in, in a, a Bayesian network or in a causal Bayesian network, uh, whether you observe these variables or intervene on them, you're going to get the same results. You probably can conclude this not through this derivation, but because of the semantics of how we do intervention, we cut the parents and set the value of the variable. There's no parents to cut in that case and so on. Now, this, the ability to do this uh, under some condition, uh, more generally, uh, people refer to it as, let me see if I can pronounce this word, exogeneity. The condition for exogeneity, which allows you to have this equality, is more general than what we have here. But for now, this is all what we need. Later, when we discuss, uh, give this an axiomatic of counterfactuals, we'll state the more general condition that allows you to do this. But for now, we're going to operate in this context. Okay, guys, let's uh, get started and have some fun now with the various scenarios that we want to discuss with counterfactual reasoning. I'm going to be operating on this example that we looked at. And we looked at two versions of it, where we have this distribution versus that distribution. And as we said, if you sum out variable unit from here or from there, you're going to get the same Bayesian network. So as far as the distribution on X and Y or offer and renew, these are all the same. And you can, you know, we, we can make these models available if you want to play with them. You can go and say, oh, let me make, it, make an offer here. Let me make an offer. You're going to see the same basic numbers everywhere. So we're going to use this as the uh, running example next. And the theme would be that I'm going to be introducing a number of prototypical counterfactual queries. And you're going to see that they will give different results on these two guys. And that will set us so that we can actually give you the formal definitions of these queries and so on. Let me just remind you, uh, this is a simple example. The two variables involved in the queries are parent and child. More generally, they don't have to be. When you have a large model, the two variables involved in a counterfactual query could be anywhere. They don't have to be a parent or a child, but this will be useful. Okay, here's the first scenario. 
we made an offer to a customer and she renewed. This is the real world. So let's reflect this uh, using what we have. If you look at the first model, I went and said, I made an offer and they renewed. And I did it with the second case. Look what happened. What happened is this distribution got updated. This, it wasn't like this before this observation. Now it's like this. And it's basically saying, okay, it cannot be a contrarian. It cannot be an always denier. It must be an always taker or responder. And here's the updated probability. Now we get different things here for the other model, okay? And by the way, uh, the probability of seeing this is 40% in both of them. And that shouldn't be surprising because as we said, both models induce the same distribution over offer and renew. Now we get to our first counterfactual query. The query is this, what is the probability? She would not have renewed had we not made the offer. So we made the offer, they renewed. Now I wanna see, what if I did not make the offer? And you see that this property is known as the property of necessity. It's a prototypical counterfactual query. Let's do it, right? How, how can we do it? That's the question. The method I'm gonna show you now is straightforward for this example. It's not gonna work in general. I'm gonna show you the general method for doing it. But what I'm gonna do next really give you the essence of what's happening in counterfactual. Here's the thing. The thing is, what did I learn from this observation? that I gave an offer and they renewed. I, I learned this distribution, right? That's what I've learned, that I'm, I'm looking at someone who's not a contrarian, not an uh, always denier, but either this or that, and these are the properties. So now when I go to the alternative scenario, the hypothetical one, and I say, what will happen if I, what would have happened if I did not make them the offer? I want to do it using this information. I don't want to give up this information. I learned this. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use the model that we started with. But instead of the prior distribution of this, I'm going to use this updated distribution. Okay, this is something you haven't done before, right? I, I modified this and I said, no, no, I'm starting with this, not with what I had initially, because I've learned this based on what happened. I ran into a situation and they told me this. And now I'm going to use this to do the hypothetical reasoning. So I'm going to go and say, okay, what happens if I did not offer them? And I'm going to get these probabilities. And to answer this question, this is 75%. This is known as the probability of necessity. We're going to write the, the form of this query formally in just a little bit. And it's 75%. So that's what happened. All right. That's our first counterfactual uh, query. And I hope you see what happened here. There's a real world in which I observed something. And then I learned in that real world something, which is this. And I took this to a hypothetical world and then used it to think alternatively of what might have happened if da, da, da. Okay? Now, if you do the same thing for the other model, you're going to get a different result. You're going to get the probability of necessity, which is 62.5%. So now we're seeing a distinction between the two models, even though they both would have giving you the same results for interventions or for association reasoning. And now you can see the value of this additional information that we uh, needed. Now, in summary, what we have here is two models that have the same distribution over observables. They have the same causal effects, but they give you different probabilities of necessity. Here's the formal definition of the probability of necessity. It is the probability that Y would not have occurred in the absence of X, given that X and Y did in fact occur. We write it like this, right? Given X was true and Y was true, what is the probability that Y would be false if I were to set X to false? Now, later in the second part of the lecture, we're gonna give syntax and semantics of these guys and, and we'll give a formal treatment, but I hope you can read this, right? This is like, why false given do false, all right? Now, let me mention one more thing, an example of this. This is pretty important and, and you get to see how pretty typical this uh, probability is. Suppose X means took drug and this means die. Then what is the probability of necessity in this case? This guy, it stands for the probability that the patient would be alive, but for the drug, okay? Typical query in litigation. Now. If you're able to show that the probability of necessity is greater than half, what does that mean? That means it's more probable than not that the patient would be alive but for the drug. And usually courts look for that, more probable than not. 
The purpose of this is not just to show another concrete example of the use of this guy, but to tell you also that sometimes, even if you don't have point estimates for these counterfactual queries, but you're able to bound them, that could be useful. In fact, when we get uh, later to the practical setting and talk about identifiability, you're gonna see actually a lot of these results are in the form of bounds that uh, they don't actually identify the, the point values of these queries, but they put bounds on them. And this gives you an example of how that could also uh, be useful. Now, there is a related notion called the probability of sufficiency, right? And this is the following. Uh, probability that setting X would produce Y in a situation where both X and Y are absent. Here's how it looks. X was false. Y was false in the real world. Now I'm asking hypothetically, uh, what is the probability that Y would be true if we set X or we intervene to make X uh, true? All right, that's the probability of sufficiency. If we wanna do it on our example, same story. I would start in the real world and I say, I did not offer and they did not renew. And now I wanna say, what is the problem that they would have renewed if I did offer? Look what happened, I got this guy. Now this is a different distribution than what I got in the previous case. I, I use it and I pose this query. I did offer them what happens here and you get a probability of sufficiency of 92.31. Uh, All right. Now, I'm gonna show you next another query, uh, which is pretty famous, that somewhat puts these things together and, and will, will make some uh, number of very important points. But uh, before we do that, I wanna show you how do you do these computations more generally? The, the technique that we used here, which is um, look at this posterior and copy it and start with this guy. This works because we only had one uh, uh, background variable. You can do this. If you had four background variables, you can do that. You can go and do this and look at their posteriors, copy them, and then do that. Why? Because even though the background variables are initially independent without any observations, they become dependent after I make observations. So if you really locally go and copy the posterior on each one of them, you haven't really covered the information. That's, that's wrong. What you really want to copy is the joint distribution over these background variables. Uh, and uh, that wouldn't work locally like we did here if you had more than one background variable. So what do you do? Uh, there is something known as the uh, twin network technique. Um, and the idea is, if this is what you have, you go and create a copy of the functional variables, that is the internal variables that are um, a function of their parents. Uh, but you do not copy the background variables. So we would have something that looks like this, right? So I'm, I'm having a scenario real world and I'm having the hypothetical world here and I'm having these variables shared between them, right? So if you had more than one background variable, you can see how this uh, would work. Now, literally what we did here is not exactly that because if you really wanna handle this literally, you should have a, a background variable for this guy as well, but that's fine. That's gonna work in this case. But I think this should illustrate the idea. Now, look how we can now do it. You give me this and you say, I offered they renewed. Now you see what happened here. And now the hypothetical scenario happens on this side. And you say, what if I did not offer? What if I did not offer? Okay, you get the property here. That's the property of necessity, okay? So they share the two worlds. They share uh, these background uh, variables. And now you can see how information is being carried from one scenario to the other. Observations on one scenario are updating the probabilities on these particular uh, background variables. And that information is then being used to uh, uh, do the second uh, scenario, all right? So this is the uh, twin network technique. And uh, as I mentioned, we have a couple of more things. Um, to discuss before we take our break. There is the probability of necessity and sufficiency. And 
This is the property that Y responds to X both ways in a way. It measures the necessity and sufficiency for X to produce Y. And it's this. What is this? This is Y would be true if I set X to true. If I set X to true, Y would be true. If I set X to false, Y would be false. And I want to compute the probability of both, right? Setting X to true makes Y true, setting it to false make it false. This is property of necessity and sufficiency. Uh, if we want to do it on the twin network, it's a little bit more work, but I'm going to still do it because I want to show you a number. Uh, because in this case, I'm doing two different interventions and I'm computing a joint over the interventions. It, given our simple network, we will be able to do it like this. Uh, I'm adding this auxiliary node uh, that is trying to see whether this came out to be yes and this came out to be no. So this is a functional node. You can set the CPD for this, you know, to do that. Uh, it has two values again. Uh, yes, no, whether it's true or false. All right, so if it's true, that means this came out yes, this came out no. And you can imagine what I'm going to do next. I'm going to go and say, okay, offer, do not offer. What is the probability that I got a yes here and I got a no here? That's what this guy's trying to do. All right, now um, you can see the probability. Here's, here's now we're going to get some really big punchline on this example and, and the slide the followed one. Look at this guy 60%. Uh, that's basically the probability of necessity in this case. Now, if you look carefully, look up here, 60%. That is not a coincidence. What is this? What am I doing here when I'm writing this? I'm asking, am I talking about a responder? Or do I have a situation where Y is following X? If I set X to true, Y becomes true. If I set it to false, Y becomes false. That's this guy. Now, what happened here? This guy is hidden. The distribution on this is really the essence of what's going on from a causal point of view. I don't have direct access to it. But by posing a counterfactual query, which is this, I'm grabbing it. So it is these counterfactual queries that are really digging deep into what's going on into a situation and extracting so these detailed aspects of it that matter for causality. Now I'm going to make this a little bit uh, more apparent next. I'm going to do this a little bit more generally. Instead of having an auxiliary node that says yes, no, I'm going to look at all combination. Yes, no, no, yes, 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 no, no, and, and make this uh, point even bolder, all right? But just before I do this, let me tell you that it's, it's known that the probability of necessity and sufficiency is related to the probability of necessity and probability of sufficiency this way. So you can combine them this way to get that guy. Okay, let's, let's go to this very important insight. This model, I added this variable outcome and it has these four values now. It's trying to see what happens with these guys. I'm, I'm going to try to intervene on these guys and I'm going to see what's going to happen in terms of outcomes. So I have these four possibilities. Okay, let's do it. Okay, look what happened. I said, offer. Do not offer. Let me see what happened in terms of responses. And I got this distribution. Now stare at this. What's this distribution? It's that. Right? Now, if you look to see what these numbers are, they're these. Every, all of them offered, did not offer. Set X to true, set X to false. And then what's happening here? In this case, five followed X. That's the 60%. That's the probability of a responder. In this case, Y was always true. It didn't matter. That's 20%. That's the probability and always taper. In this case, Y was the opposite of X. 15% probability of a contrarian. And in this case, Y was always false. It didn't matter whether I said X to true or false. That's the probability of a denier. Once more, let's see what's going on here. Counterfactual queries really are digging deeper into things. You saw later or earlier, when we summed out these guys, we lost these details. So I cannot give you that information by posing associational or interventional queries. 
you need counterfactual queries to dig to that level of detail about a situation. And that's what matters when you're making certain decisions. We're gonna end this with uh, an example that makes this point even stronger. Um, and show you why you can do this using interventions, that interventions cannot help you dig to a certain level that is necessary for certain kind of decision making. But since we're on it here, I wanna introduce another property that is used a lot in the second part when we talk about identifiability, and this is not as monotonous. The, the name is not suggestive of what's going on. It's actually pretty intuitive. We'll give the formal definition of it later, but let's look at what's going on. See what's going on here? We looked at this and we said that these numbers correspond to these counterfactual queries. Now, monotonicity effectively says that I want this to be zero, no contrarians, right? I, I don't have a situation where I have someone that if I offer them, they don't renew. And if I don't offer them, they renew. Now, no customer who will not renew if offered, but will renew if not offered. Or no patient will die if they take the drug, but will survive if they don't, all right? Uh, it may look like it's a strong condition. In some settings, it's not at all. It's a natural to assume that there are no contrarians. And it turns out that this property enables a lot of identifiability results. Now, let me just warn you once more. Everything we've been doing is in the simple case where we have X and Y, and X is a parent of Y. When we do later monotonicity, there is no assumption that X and Y are parent and child. So what we're doing here is the localized version of this, but it gives you the essence of what's going on, right? When, when you have X and Y anywhere in, in the, the model, it's, it's still meaningful to talk about how Y responds to X, which one of these ways. And then it's meaningful to say, I, I would want to disallow or assume that this can never happen. So we're going to get to that later. But I, I want to end quickly before our break with, with uh, uh, a few points. Uh, there are more counterfactual queries or quantities. There's something called probability of disablement, probability of enablement, and, and here's their, uh, their forms. Uh, the causality book by Pearl talk about these, you can consult that. But I wanna end with uh, basically uh, two things. One is an example about why is intervention or reasoning not refined enough and can actually mislead you in certain situations? This is pretty important. And then just a slide on what we're going to do in the uh, second part. So look what's going to happen here. I'm going to look at the same scenario that we were looking at, offering someone an incentive to renew and whether they renewed or not. But I'm going to use now two different distribution here. Look what happened here. I'm assuming I have a population where half are responders and half are contrarians. So there are no always takers, no always deniers. So every person is either, I offer them, they take the offer. I don't offer them, they don't. Or a contrarian. If I offer them, they don't renew. If I don't give them any incentives, they renew. Now look at the situation here. Here I'm saying, no, actually there's no responders. There are no contrarians. Everybody is either always taker or always denier. So half the population will always renew, regardless of whether you offer them or not. The other half, they always do not renew. Doesn't matter whether you offer them or not, right? Now, in this case, if you go ahead and compute causal effect on this versus that, look what's gonna happen. I offer, what is the probability that they were in you? 50%. Let's do it here. I offered, what is the probability that they were in you? 50%. Same cause and effect in both cases. But look, you know what's going on here. Here, it's 50% because if, you know, have the population always in use and the other always does not. You actually have no impact on anything. In this case, no. What happened is you offered, um, Half a population likes that, so they renew. The other were pissed off by your offer, and they're just like, did not renew. Very different scenarios. Here, your action has no impact. Here, your action actually did trigger this 50%. You can see this with cause and effect. Cause and effect could not tell us these distinctions. Now, let's look at the probability of necessity. 
here versus that. And then if you do that, you compute the probability of necessity like we did it, you're gonna find the probability of necessity here is 100% and it's 0% here. See what happened? Causal effect didn't reveal enough details about the causality of the situation. Counterfactual queries did. And this is pretty significant. I hope you can imagine uh, how much you'll be missing and how misguided one can be if making decisions without this kind of analysis. Uh, because you may be blind, basically, about what's going on, and you may do actions that are unnecessary uh, or may have unintended consequences. Um, let's wrap it up before the break with this last slide. To emphasize again that everything we've done so far was on the simple case x goes to y but believe it or not <laughs> this really told us the story the fact that that x and y are not parent and child it changes some of the math and how much hard work people have to do to do various things but doesn't change the essence of the story of what's going on what information you need what you're going after how is this different from intervention we conveyed all of that um, it also particularly allowed us to stress the extra information that's needed and why we need it. And, and the, this notion that we need to transfer information from one situation into another that's possibly conflicting. Uh, as I said, uh, counterfactual reasoning does not require that. And actually, when we come back, we will give the more general treatment. Um, and that the more formal treatment, uh, we will st start by talking about uh, structure causal models and then use them to set up syntax and semantics of counterfactual queries and then get to the practical setting uh, about doing uh, identifiability from data and so on. So 10 minute break and uh, we will resume after that.